Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Dr. Ryan Newhoffel, a physician in Lawrence, Kansas. A few weeks ago, a few episodes ago, on an episode we did about the Statrix, I discussed uh, Dr. New, as he goes, as his patients call him, Dr. New's practice, which is called, sometimes called concierge medicine and sometimes called direct primary care uh, medicine. And I brought it up as a really good example of something that defeats the Statrix and then Dr. Newhoffel actually contacted me, which is how this episode got started. So to uh, welcome you, welcome to Free Thoughts, by the way, Dr. New. Thank you for having me. And I guess we just start there. I, I in the episode I directed our listeners to newcare.net, which is the website of your practice. But if they go there, they immediately see that it's very different. It has prices and a bunch of things that you never see in Ameri American medicine. So what is what is the model of this direct primary care you're running, and, and how does it generally work? Yeah, well, yeah. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, so, uh, direct primary care uh, has been around for quite a while, um, and simply put, it's a direct relationship financially uh, with a primary care physician. So, the way that most practices are, are structured is kind of like joining a gym or subscribing to Netflix. Uh, pe people pay us a monthly fee, a membership fee, is what most people call it. And for that monthly fee, um, we provide full transparency in most primary care services, um, and we're able to do things a lot better for people. Um, uh, save the money and, and many circumstances, um, but it's really it's kind of stripping away all of the the red tape and and uh, middlemen that, that normal healthcare has in America. What's then the benefit for you? Because obviously this isn't the model of most physicians, um, and so why why aren't more of them doing this sort of thing? Well, that, that's that's a big complicated question of why more people aren't doing it. I mean, to me, the the benefits are self evident. But um, you know, the doctors who are doing this, the the big difference is when you're running a medical practice. You know, it, it is a business at some level, and so the 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 red tape, the the paperwork, the administrative load, uh, the business of medicine is very very complex. And so, um, you know, when you're running a, a small small business, uh, um, you know, the simpler your your business model is, the more you you can focus on your mission, uh, the services you provide, and unfortunately, in, in American healthcare, um, uh, that the, the the system has gotten so complicated that uh, it distracts you from what you're really trying to do, which is care for people and, and provide them that service, your your professional service. Um, so that's really the big benefit is you can kind of start with a blank slate and and structure things um, uh, to to your patients' needs, uh, and I don't have to worry as much about you know the paperwork side of thing. There's Many studies on this, um, and, and and the awareness of the administrative bloat is is very well known and very well studied in medicine. But people don't quite know how they're supposed to escape that. So everyone, regardless of their politics, says yes. There's too much paperwork. There's too many you know hoops to jump through. But what can we possibly do about that? So we've kind of created this monster, and people just don't know how to get away from it. And direct primary care is an attempt to do that. And and what do you have to do in order to set up this practice? Or you have to reject. Certain things that the government yeah. offers in order to set this up. So, what do you what do you have to do? Well, if you think about if you think about the normal healthcare system, pe people actually it's it, there's it's, it's very difficult to actually talk about healthcare uh, to most lay people because they immediately start associating everything with health insurance, and and they don't even often make a distinction between the two. And you can hear this even even in people who are fairly well versed in healthcare and health policy. They, they, they use the terms interchangeably. Um, and so uh, the, the entire structure of our healthcare system is based upon a third party fee for service payment, uh, meaning that some third party has collected the money, either an insurance company or the government. And then they dole that out in the way that they see best fit a fee for every service that I provide. Um, and so that, that transaction between the doctor and whoever's paying, which is 90% of the time, not the patient paying or 90% of that tab is not paid by the patient that dictates everything you know the way that you get paid uh, you know it requires certain uh, documentation it requires uh, uh, certain certain uh, things that the doctor does in order to get paid and oftentimes that doesn't it doesn't really uh, align with the the service you're even trying to provide so it really limits you and what you can do but most people they think about their health care and health insurance as this one kind of messy thing, but they don't make a distinction between me and a health insurance company at, at some level. And so you don't take Medicare or Medicaid? I don't, I don't take any insurance at all. Um, and really that system, that fee-for-service 
system is is uh, implemented in private healthcare and government healthcare. So it's not unique just to Medicare and Medicaid. Um, I, I would say dealing with you know Blue Cross or Aetna or take the pick of your private um, insurance company is is very similar. I mean there there are some distinctions, uh, but this is not unique to just government payers. This is true of all third party payers. And and really it's not even health insurance at this point. At that point, it is a prepaid managed care system. Um, you know, uh, we, we call that an HMO or a PPO. Um, and so really it's not insurance as we would think of it in any other industry. If, if you, you have house insurance, you know, you don't use your house insurance to, to clean your carpets or fix a broken window or repaint your front door. Um, you, you use it in case it, your house burns down to the ground and car insurance, you can make a, a, a lot of other analogies, but we really don't have insurance at all. We have a prepaid managed care system in healthcare, at least for the past 40 to 50 years in America. In the episode of Free Thoughts where Trevor first introduced your practice, the the argument that he was making more broadly was that we we get these laws and these regulations and in this case the the system that created our modern health insurance or managed care regime and then it becomes really difficult to kind of think outside of that box. We think of that as the way the world is and so I, I find myself as you're describing this kind of – Still thinking within that box, um, in that, so the, if I'm a if I'm a patient, um, your service provides primary care. But if I get into serious trouble, I'm going to have to go to a hospital or specialists or something that's going to be really expensive and something that I'm going to want insurance for. And so, I I'm going to want insurance even if I'm using absolutely. You. And then so then why would I? Then you go to you if I already have this insurance that would also be covering the kinds of things that you provide. Well, the, the system that that covers A to Z already exists. It's called an HMO or PPO, and is is what has led to what we have now. Um, so no, and 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 that's one of the big misnomers that um, you know direct primary care. Um, it, I'm not anti insurance. I am for using insurance in a smart way. Um, you know, to make to make an analogy, and I know that cars and people are different. I I think my job is special, and what I do is unique. But um, if you tried to use your car insurance to do everything related to your car, um, if you used it for uh, tire rotations, oil changes, uh, um, you know, you would have to get a, a prior approval before you left town, and they would tell you which gas station you could go to. Um, and so that wouldn't make any sense. No one, everyone would reject that idea. Now, if you have a, a you know, a, an accident and you wreck your car and, 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 you know, you have to pay $10,000 to fix it or replace it, insurance then kind of makes sense. That trade-off of, of, of payment for that makes sense. Um, but much in the same way of healthcare, what I do as a primary care physician um, can accomplish what most people need on most years. I would say 80 to 90% of people, 80, 90% of the years of their life, they don't need anything more than what a, a, a good, uh, high practicing primary care physician can provide them. There's always going to be circumstances where things get, uh, you know, very, very expensive. And, and those unexpected expensive things, of course, you need um, a financial tool in place to cover those. But why we are trying to cover or pay for primary care services um, and, and, and the, the very rare chance of getting run over by a bus in the same mechanism and same manner really doesn't make sense. So, yes, it's all health care, but the way that you know, neurosurgery or cancer treatment works is so radically different than what I do as, as a family physician. I, I don't think there needs to be an overarching way that we do all of it in the same way. So one of the things that our my colleagues here at the Cato Institute doing healthcare have pushed for for a long time is health saving accounts. And among the things that you opt out of with your models, you opt out of insurance. But can you take? Could I pay for your services with my HSA? Well, right now that's actually a, a pretty uh, a hotly debated topic in the direct primary care world. So the way that the IRS views this and has structured HSAs um, has made it very complicated. And, and the short answer is no. But I won't bore people with all the the, the IRS statements on this. Um, so I think the system that we all envision is that people have great access to primary care because everyone, regardless of their politics, um, you know, wants to figure out how do we provide people better primary care. If we can do that, we can keep people away from the expensive care most of the time. Um, and so, uh, you know, returning more, you know, uh, control of the monies back to people through an HSA is a good idea. But unfortunately, the way the HSAs were structured was still kind of insurance centered. In fact, I have an HSA and because I changed my my insurance policy, I don't, I can't contribute to it anymore. So HSAs are are kind of a step in the right direction, but there's still a lot of, uh, they were still formulated around the idea that insurance is going to be managing 
all of your care at all levels from A to Z. I'm looking at newcare.net right now and um, and every time I look at this, my mind still gets gets blown. Um, <laughs> you have okay, so membership. Um, if you're looking at it says individuals, you pay if you're 18 under, you pay thirty dollars a month. Adults 19 to 69 pay fifty dollars a month, and you get communications, phone, text, and emails with doctor and nurse, which is mind blowing right now. I'm already pretty surprised. Clinic visits when required, yearly wellness and prevention planning, some routine labs and tests, medical equipment, leads such as crutches, yearly flu shot, and access to discounted wholesale pricing on other services. Uh, so – and this is insane. If you go back to this. The, the uh, you, you have high tech after hours. You do after – you do house calls, which is like 1920s kind of <laughs> – our yeah. town, Thornton Wilder stuff, I think. Uh, same day, you can get, you've, here, you can see people on the same day. You can have extended visits and you have upfront prices. Um, now, why doesn't this stuff exist for people who aren't doing direct primary care? Why is this so sci-fi well, and why can you do it? Well, I, I think it, it, you, know, you, you can kind of get into the chicken or the egg argument. But I think the way that we have structured payment and the fee-for-service, third-party, very complicated system – you know, it's not that doctors don't care. It's not that doctors don't want to serve their patients. Almost every physician I've ever met is very caring and very committed to providing great care. Um, but the the payment, the business of medicine, does not uh, lead to those types of things. So it's what's really interesting, and I, I'm not uh, uh, trying to diminish, you know, how cool I am. But <laughs> um, but a lot of our patients don't even quite understand this. They think maybe that I'm I'm able to do the text message and email and see them the same day just because I'm really nice. Uh, and I am pretty nice and sometimes cool, but that's not why I can do what I do. You know, um, doctors get paid per office visit in the normal system. And so if that's the only way a doctor can get paid, basically the only way they can change, uh, you know, the revenue equation is to bring more people in per day. That's the only way they get paid. They can do more stuff to people, but they don't get paid to sit around and talk on the phone or email or text messages with patients. I do. I, I structured my business so that I can meet people where they are when they need to be seen. Um, but even further, I, I, I have such a lean business model that if you look at the average practice, um, in order to run a practice, um, you know, per physician or per provider, you're looking at a minimum of four to eight staff just for kind of the administrative side of medicine. So the majority of, of overhead costs for a, a, a small medical practice or a hospital either is, is actually not clinical stuff. It's people who are coders and billers and people who are waiting on a hold. Um, and it's all of this kind of very messy um, business stuff. And most people are not – who are employed in healthcare are not you know, clinical. They're not actually talking to patients, taking care of them. Patients don't see all this stuff. This is stuff that happens in an office or a back room somewhere. And because I can, I can work directly for my patients and not have to hassle with that stuff. My entire clinic is run with me and a nurse. I have no one else. So my overhead is very, very low. It's very high tech and very lean. And, and, and I do it because I structure the payment so I can do those services. Um, it's not because I'm nice or cool, but in the normal system, it makes total sense. I mean, we are getting exactly what we pay for. So, your patients then – I mean there are people – and we, we talked before and you didn't like the term concierge medicine. Uh, but but your patients – you're in Lawrence, Kansas, which is a, a nice college town. Um, they're pretty rich I assume and, and this probably all doesn't work if, if for poorer patients. <laughs> uh, yeah, another huge misconception. Thanks for the setup. Um, <laughs> um, oh, really? I'm shocked. Keep going. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think that's the big misperception um, that you know the majority of people who are struggling to for healthcare or not, you know, they're not all poor. Um, and so the, the patients that we serve, in fact, are uh, probably a lower, uh, you know, socioeconomic demographic than, than what even the average practice is. 50% of my patients are uninsured. Um, you know, the majority of them have high deductibles. So they're paying boatloads of money, inflated, uh, mind you, uh, costs out of pocket for, for what they need. So we're really trying to serve both of those. We're, we're, we're not just trying to to say like, well, you know, the country club, if you pay me a thousand dollars, I'll take better care of you. And I, I don't have any qualms with that. I wouldn't, I don't begrudge anyone for doing that. But, but what we're trying to solve is a much bigger problem. We want to provide better quality care. Um, and we also want to make it more affordable and more transparent. So almost every direct primary care physician I know is, is serving that demographic. We're serving regular middle class people. Now, not everyone knows about us. Not everyone understands what we do. Um, but we're not serving and, and, the reason that I'm reluctant and I never use the term concierge is because 
a lot of concierge, probably a majority of who, people who call themselves concierge, they are charging a membership fee or retainer fee, but that's on top of the normal messy insurance billing system. So there's a huge company called MDVIP. Um, they consider themselves concierge. I mean, it's VIP. It's in their name. Um, and, and they basically are, are charging people, you know, about $1,600 a year on top of the normal insurance coding and billing systems. When people go in, they're still paying for office visits. They're not doing the ancillary discounts and services that we are. Um, and so I think we, we've been very uh, um, kind of typecast um, because concierge medicine has been around for a long time. It will always exist. There's always going to be people catering to the country club. But I think direct primary care is trying to solve a much bigger problem um, than just, you know, people who are wanting special treatment. How scalable is this model? So it works for primary care, but could it be used to replace our current system for things like specialists or hospitals or the the bigger, more scary stuff? Well, you know, I mean, primary care is unique. There's no doubt about that. The the ongoing relationship that that people have with their primary doctor, um, you know, I, I might be overly romantic about this, but I, I think it is a unique relationship. And so the way that other services should be structured, I, I don't I don't think that, you know, you can take all the same principles that we have applied as primary care doctors who have this kind of longitudinal ongoing relationship with people um, and apply that to something like you know, someone needing a, a, an orthopedic surgery. However, I, there are specialists who are, are catering to more uh, transparent um, uh, pricing models. Um, I, I think uh, the Cato Institute has highlighted um, the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, Dr. Keith Smith. Um, so he, he's, he's shown that you can absolutely strip away some of the, the fat and medicine and, and, and boil down the the payment system, make it simpler. Um, but of course, those things, there's always going to be a time and place. If you get admitted to the hospital, if you have surgery, those things are, are kind of inherently expensive. But I do think that what we're seeing in the market is because direct primary care is growing so much that there are um, services that are starting to cater to us. Um, an example of that would be um, there's a there's a company called Rubicon MD, um, which is basically um, an e-consultant platform. Um, think of it kind of like uh, a doctors, uh, primary care doctors and specialists having like a, a, a secure place like Facebook where we can chat about our patients. And so I can use a, a, a platform like this, um, share um, a case of, of one of my patients with this uh, um, consultant um, service, and I get responses uh, within you know hours typically of the specialist. So I can share a picture of a rash or lab values or an x-ray. And instead of sending people through the normal, you know, you got to pay your copay and wait two weeks to see the specialist, I can get responses within the same day. And, and, and that's also mind blowing when I, when I describe that to people that I can, I can meet online with a specialist and that won't work for everything. They can't do surgery over the internet. Um, but the intellectual side of that specialty care could be handled most of the time with a remote efficient. And I don't charge my patients for that service at all. So they basically get free online um, uh, consultants, um, unlimited as much as they need. Um, and so that, that, that's how much like a, a radical shift in thinking, um, can occur if you kind of strip away the, the managed care aspect of these things. My, my head is spinning. I, I thought I even understood a little bit to get out of the Statrix mindset about how much you can do, but it's, it's <laughs> we all live there. We all, we all, yeah. You, you have a great term you used. We talked before uh, battered patient syndrome. Uh, yeah. Well, you, you describe what that means when people come to you and, and experience your care. What I have experienced doing this for almost five Five years is that it, it's really hard for people to even imagine something different. Um, and so I, I have I've had many experiences where I've spelled out what we do um, to a patient. You know, they have their own medical history and they've kind of, you know, thought we were cool. They've heard friends say we were cool and but they want to know, you know, on paper, how, how can you save me money? I want to see it. And so we spell that out for them. We're like, you're going to be paying us $50 a month. If you average three or four visits a year, you get these labs done. We have these discounts on these meds and we've demonstrated to them in black and white. You can save money with us. And, and, then, and then they say, at what point are you trying to sell me time timeshares in Mexico yeah, or yeah. Amway products? Absolutely. And, and they think there's some type of catch, you know, that that either I'm I'm giving I'm importing drugs illegally from Guatemala <laughs> or or that I'm somehow like a huckster. Um, and, and it's really hard for them to even get over that, that it's possible to do what I do for the price that I do it um, because they have seen, you know, I, I've had patients, um, um, a good example, um, you know, like patients who've had an MRI uh, previously and need an, another one um, and they'd paid $2,000 at the hospital. 
And, I, and, and they said, you know, doc, I think I need an MRI in the other knee, but I really don't want to pay for it. And I said, well, you know, the good news is I know a place that's, you know, not too far away from here. It's, it's uh, you know, they give you an upfront cash price for MRI, 450 bucks. Um, you know, so we can get it done and you don't have to pay $2,000. And they're like, well, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I want a good MRI. <laughs> you know, like, like somehow it was like some type of generic, like terrible. And I'm like, no, it's actually a big radiology center that's owned by radiologists. It's probably a better machine than the hospitals, but they just how is that you know they, they're confused about how that's possible how can one place charge you know twenty five hundred dollars and you're telling me if i just paid cash i could spend 400 and it's just as good um they just they they, they think there's some kind of, of trick and so i think that kind of over decades of, of having this managed care and and lack of transparency that people it's hard for them to fathom that that we could do what we do um and and they think there's some kind of trick to it why are the prices so the, the insurance companies are at least to some extent, competing with each other, um, and they, you know, they tell you how much your premiums are going to be, and we'd all like to be paying less. And so, if an MRI can cost four hundred and fifty bucks, why is the insurance company charging twenty five hundred? Why isn't someone else, some other insurance company, saying, "Hey, you know, we're going to provide the same managed care, but our the the amounts we're going to pay to the radiologist and elsewhere is going to be so much lower that you're going to pay a much lower yeah. premium. Well, well, I, I think the equation starts the, the formulation of this starts at the provider level because the insurance is just a payment or managed care is a payment mechanism. It's it's not where kind of the the the, the cost of everything starts. So if you look at where everything starts, if you take lab work, office visits, MRIs, what, whatever you're discussing. Um, if if the person providing that has to have all of this overhead expense, so. Um, Labs are a great example. So we we subcontract or client bill labs, and and when we contract out the rate for our labs, we're paying them a simple you know invoice, monthly invoice. There's no coding. There's no you know alphabet soup for them to justify getting paid by an insurance company. So that for everyone who deals with insurance, that's very very complicated, and that comes at a cost. You know, it's usually a, a, a direct cost in employing someone to do that. But if you can have a simple cash transaction. Um, it changes everything. Um, we, we, when we client bill our lab work or x-rays, um, we're, we're getting them at less than half or sometimes 80% less even when that what Medicare would pay. And, and people consider Medicare a low payer. Um, but that's because the people that are providing that service, the lab company or, or the place that takes my x-rays, they're like, I just, you just, it's a simple cash payment. Well, yeah, we could do that for 25 bucks then. But if we have to deal with you know, all of the hassles and hoops of billing insurance, because if you went and used your MRI, you know, your insurance to pay for that MRI, well, the hospital and I am still dealing with that paperwork and all of that administrative aspect of things. But if they just got an upfront, simple transaction, it lowers, um, you know, the costs all around. Um, so that they, they, even other providers are recognizing, um, but e- even that is not that simple because I have, I have specialists and, and other companies who are like, uncomfortable accepting cash for payment. And that's kind of where the state tricks comes in. And some people can't even realize that, you know, oh, I, this would actually be much easier for me and I would still make as much money. But because well, they don't want they just want to they don't want to see the cash on the front end. They just want it to hide in the back end and that makes them feel good about it. I, I, that, that may be part of it. Yeah, there's definitely some kind of – there's already cash being transacted in the insurance system. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. not – you, you, know, you want to go in and walk out with just your copay or whatever and you feel good about yourself. Well, it's funny because a lot of the critics of direct primary care, they, they you know, they, they'll kind of in a despairing, a disparagingly way, they'll, they'll, they'll say we're, we're cash based or we only work for cash. And my immediate response is, uh, is, is Blue Cross paying you in potatoes? I mean, they're, <laughs> they're, they're paying you in cash. Now, there's no, there's, I, I don't see any altruism in a third party paying me versus, uh, um, you know, a, a big company paying me versus my patient directly. But yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of kind of like, a subtle thing saying something is cash based when, you know, I, I know that there's other physicians in my community who charge four or five hundred dollars for an ingrown toenail removal. My patients get, you know, charged get ten dollars because of the procedure equipment that I use. Um, so, yes, I'm cash based. It was ten dollars for them to get their ingrown toenail uh, removed and it's four hundred and fifty dollars at another place in town. So, yeah, I mean, I guess we're both cash based. So this sounds like some someone could be thinking that you're in the profit motive game here and uh, that there's something unseemly about this. That's sort of essentially the – one of the big critiques of of any sort of market-based medicine is like medicine for profit is inherently immoral. Now, of course, you have your two-person operation and you have a family and you want to take home something at the end of the day. <laughs> yes, I do. And this, I do. And this has something to do with how you negotiate prices, for example. 
because you, you, you negotiate prices on these MRIs and you're testing and you, you, you use your patient pool to negotiate this. But you also have a personal incentive to, to make it, uh, it you know, as cheap for them and also so you don't have to pay as much either so you can actually walk home. And that seems to be ultimately a good thing for the patients. I mean, I think it's a win-win all around. Of um, course, yes. So, so yes, um, my, this is my business. This is my livelihood. I absolutely could not do this if I, if I didn't make an income. Um, and and I even have you know patients kind of think that I'm some type of saint when I, which I'm happy um, that that they want to label me as that. But no, I mean this this is my livelihood. And so, um, you know, my expectation was to make at least an average income for a family physician. Um, if I somehow make more than that um, down the line, that's awesome. But yeah, I mean, I, this is not a um, I'm not doing this out of a purely altruistic thing. I mean, I if I wanted to do that, I would go volunteer, and I do do that. Um, but yeah, this is my livelihood. I, I'm just I'm trying to um, you know be an advocate for my patients by providing them that transparency and services. Uh, uh, but but I, yes, at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I I have to make money, or I, I I can't do this. Now you talk about a lot of discussion is talked is discussed on the uh, turning people away, turning chronic conditions, uh, and that's a big part of whenever. Every time we reform healthcare, as we did with Obamacare, that we could turn uh, diabetics or people like this away. Uh, how does your model deal with chronic conditions, and are you faced with the situation of, of turning people away and I, I'm, I'm just going to say and letting them die on the streets because that's what pe- again <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the classic critique. Well, well, uh, yeah, I, I think I care for them much better. Um, and so, uh, you know, the funny thing is, is because of the flexibility of of, of what we do, I'm able to meet people's needs of, of all levels. Um, I have patients who are extremely sick on, on hospice. I have patients who are extremely complicated with chronic diseases. Um, and I think they need this type of care more than anything else, um, more than anyone else. You know, if someone's healthy and they never see the doctor, then I guess no medical care is really that helpful for them. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the, 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 the need of those type of patients, this is, this is more important to them than anyone else. And so whenever we have people enroll with us, um, our pricing is, is based upon age to a small degree. I mean, all adults 19 to 69 pay the same and seniors pay a little more and kids pay a little bit less, but, um, we don't have any type of, 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 uh, screening process in terms of their medical conditions. Um, in fact, most of our patients do have chronic disease is um, because they see a much better value because I'm providing them with lab work and, you know, they tend to require more visits. So they're getting a much better bang for their buck than a person who never goes to the doctor. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I think that I don't have to worry about that at my level because primary care, some, everyone needs primary care, whether they're in, you know, horribly controlled diabetic or they're a healthy 22 year old, you know, they need different things at different times. Um, but I don't necessarily have to factor that in. I, I have to factor in, you know, can I can I have enough patients who are paying a fee to make my revenue high enough that I can take home, you know, a decent pay? Um, but I have uh, no no requirement or no uh, litmus test or anything like that about about people's pre existing medical conditions. Now that's different when you start talking about you know uh, uh, insurance and and they have they have a risk adjustment. Um, but the riskiest thing is is I have to see people a little bit more. Um, but but I'm I'm not on the hook for you know if they end up with a heart attack or dialysis because I'm not insurance. So I, that doesn't even enter our equation at all. So now you told me a story about a patient who came in to see you uh, who. Was at a, I think it was the direct primary care summit, who discussed who who seems like one of these patients that the American healthcare system or has been consistently reformed to try and save, and but still they're constantly there. They slip through the cracks. They slip through the safety net. They have many different pre-existing conditions. Uh, can you tell? Can you tell that story to our listeners? Yeah. So um, uh, last year at the direct primary care summit, um, uh, which is a big you know group uh, meeting for the doctors who are practicing this model or, or planning on it. Um, I, I, um, uh, had one of my patients actually get up on stage and tell his story. And I think that people's stories are so much more powerful about the, the, the bad aspects of our system than anything I could ever say. I could talk here for hours and, uh, you know, I'm a doctor and I'm, I'm in it for myself and all of that. But whenever you, you sit down and you listen to people's stories about how the system has failed them, it, it really changes your thinking about it. Um, so despite, everyone's best intentions, you know, and I, I think most people who are in healthcare, even, even probably most of the people in the policy world, you know, they think what they're doing is helping people. But as a doctor in the trenches, I see so many people, whether they have insurance or not, 
who fall through the cracks, who get bad care, who avoid care. Um, and and I, so I, I, I took one of my patients um, um, who had had a, a really bad stroke, um, was hospitalized for, for a week, um, you know, had really never gotten much medical care prior to that because, you know, he, he a hardworking guy, didn't, you know, he had had insurance a little bit here and there, but he'd never really, you know, uh, probably taken care of himself like he should and ended up having a stroke and got discharged from the hospital with, with a boatload of medications. Um, and uh, I'm, he had, I'm sure he had a social worker in the hospital and he ran through the hospital system like, you know, I, I'm sure most people think should be done. Um, but they sent him out into the wild with no actual plan to take care of these problems. And so they ended up referring him to kind of a safety net clinic, um, which is supposed to take care of poor, uninsured people. And, and I know this clinic. They're very well-meaning, very well-intentioned. And because of some paperwork snafus, this guy, because he's self-employed, it made it look like he made a little more than he really did. So they referred him to me. Um, he was very um, – you know, very upset about his whole experience. You know, he wanted to get back to work and, and, and really was determined to do that, but it felt very turned off and felt like they were kind of just trying to push him onto disability or something like that, according to him. Um, but he, they sent him home with a bunch of prescriptions that cost hundreds or thousands of dollars when he went to the pharmacy. And he's, I have no way to pay for any of that stuff. So I'm glad they gave me these two, but they didn't really give me a plan and I have no way to afford this. So, you know, through a relationship that took, you know, over a year, we worked very hard to, to kind of get control of, of his diabetes and his high blood pressure and all of these problems. Um, you know, we were able to lower the cost for him tremendously because we were aware of it. Um, and, and so he's, you know, he's back working full time. And, um, you know, he's the type of guy that, that I think a lot of times, you know, gets kind of written off that, that we call them a train wreck. And, you know, they, they, they have a terrible thing happen and they're very, you know, uh, uh, difficult um, from a medical standpoint to kind of get right on the right track. And I think in the normal system, I, I've seen so many people like him fail because there wasn't someone there to to be his advocate. Um, and again, it's not that we don't have resources. They gave him lots of paperwork and you know, tried to direct him in the right place, but there really was no one there. So um, what I've kind of developed in my community is in some respects, I've become often a safety net for the safety net clinics. Um, you know, if someone doesn't have the right, you know, paperwork, if they're not a citizen, if they don't live in the right county, if they make a little bit too much, you know, they're kind of like, well, you know, you either have insurance or you qualify for this or you're, you're you know, you're SOL. Um, and so I think that's a huge need that we're serving here for a lot of people. It seems that that relationship too, the the ability to court a relationship with your patient without the administrative bloat infecting everything about what you're doing in terms of the kind of attention and care and discussion that you have in the doctor-patient relationship. It seems that the system we have now, the system created by and run by government is parasitic on creating good relationships between doctors and patients and maybe that's one of the appeals that doctors f see in the direct primary care model. Oh, uh, one one hundred percent, one hundred percent. The the least valued thing in our in our current healthcare system is time. Um, you, you don't get paid to spend time with people. Um, you know, it, 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 in in the normal insurance based world, if I did a knee injection for someone with uh, arthritis, you know, injected a steroid in their knee, I you know, Medicare, a private insurance company would probably reimburse me a hundred to two hundred dollars uh, as an orthopedic surgeon, three or four hundred for some odd reason. Um, but if uh, if I spent you know. Uh, 30 minutes talking to someone about their diabetes, which would never happen because we don't have the luxury of doing that, I probably would get paid about $70 or $60. Um, a, a knee injection takes me, by the way, about one minute. Um, and so you're, you're really setting up a system where uh, you're incentivized to do things to people. You know, we're really good in America at, at doing procedures and testing and all that stuff, but we're really not uh, good at doing stuff for people. And sometimes that's time. And it's not it's not uh, easy to to kind of wrap your hands around that from a scientific standpoint, um, but but the average physician visit in America is for an established patient is less than ten minutes. And you know if someone comes in with a sore throat, yeah, I can handle that in ten minutes. But a lot of patients are very complicated, and even if they come in for a sore throat, you know they have all these other chronic conditions and they have all these social factors. And so for a physician to sit down with someone for eight or ten minutes, you can't not accomplish very much. I don't care how smart you are, um, and I think patients since that, that they walk away dissatisfied and doctors do the same. Um, and, and I, I always, uh, tell people that I would rather be an average doctor with adequate time than the smartest doctor in the world with not enough time. Um, because you, you just can't, there's no substitute for that. Um, and, and unfortunately the way that the payment model is structured, I, I could have never done 
what I did with, with, with Blaine, my patient. Um, you know, I, I spent 30 to 45 minutes, I think probably an hour on the first visit. Um, and I did that every few weeks until we got his, his stuff under control. And that's just, that's impossible in the normal system. You could never do, I mean, you would never stay in business. I say, and you could do it. Uh, you would go out of business very quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it really does just change that equation and puts the, the value, uh, back on time. And I think that's something that's sorely, sorely missing. How much do you think that the, that administrative gloat that separates the doctors from the patients is contributing to this sort of well publicized exodus from of doctors from the business uh, either to either a not go into the first place or b get out of it or get out of uh, family care and get into specialization but this is often discussed and it mm-hmm. seems like there must be a contributing factor oh yeah no no doubt about it and i think you know, there, there's multiple factors at play here um, for the burnout issue, um, and and even if you look at, uh, sadly, if you look at suicide rates among physicians, they have skyrocketed over the past decade or two, um, and I think that's a huge part of it. You know, becoming a doctor is really, really hard. You make a ton of sacrifices to get. To, to where you become, uh, you know, able to care for people, and then people are kind of uh, smacked in the face with reality of of feeling like they're a clerk, um, and and I think that's demoralizing. Um, I, I talk to physicians all the time who are extremely burned out. Um, even a lot of my my classmates and um, you know people I went to residency with, they've changed jobs two or three times, and I've only you know been out of residency for five six years now. Um, and so yeah, I think that there's a lot of dissatisfaction. People taking non clinical jobs, you know, um, but but yeah. I think the, the 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 big reason that most people go in uh, uh, to, to medicine is because they truly want to help people. There's a personal aspect of that. Of course, there's an accomplishment and achievement and all of that. Um, but but I think it's that personal connection that really kind of allows you to withstand all of the pressures and stressors of medicine. And without that, you're you're just a, a really you know uh, a stressed out clerk. Um, and and physicians don't want to be that at all. Um, so yeah, I think it's a huge part of it. One of the common themes that we talk about quite a lot on Free Thoughts is the way that entrenched interests can interfere, can use politics to interfere with new and innovative models. And so is that something that the direct primary care experiences? Like what's the what's the political environment for this now and into the future? Are there people working against it because it would hurt their models? Um, what do politicians think of it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, to this stage, uh, or at least until very recently, uh, I would say direct primary care has been the most bipartisan healthcare topic around. I mean, it, it, the awareness of it is, is, is relatively small, but growing quickly. Um, and so most of the, the states who have packed past direct primary care legislation, which is, is kind of a formality. It doesn't actually directly benefit us or grow us, but basically protects us from some types of regulations. Um, um, it's been very bipartisan. So in most states where this has kind of become a, a discussion at, at the legislature uh, uh, for that state, it hasn't been partisan at all. Um, there's been a few things uh, recently in the state of Virginia. Uh, uh, Terry McAuliffe um, uh, voted down a direct primary care bill. Um, yeah, I, apparently, there's a lot of internal politics in Virginia that I don't understand, but it's more of a political uh, move than anything else. Um, but the, the, the good thing is that at this stage, um, you know, at the federal level in most states, um, direct primary care has kind of uh, been uh, um, an acceptable idea. Uh, in fact, uh, direct primary care, uh, to many people's uh, uh, shock, is included in the Affordable Care Act. Um, so even at the time, there was a handful of us, I believe, um, uh, around uh, when that when that bill was written. But it is included in the Affordable Care Act as kind of an option. Now there's a lot of kind of messy uh, things around that and what it means. And HHS really hasn't done much with it. Um, but yeah, this is not like some type of political movement. And I, I'm, I'm I'm really trying to, to 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 be careful about trying to 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 frame this, and I think other direct primary care doctors are. We we don't want this to be a political issue because as soon as it gets framed like that, that this is a Republican idea or a Democrat idea, I think that people reflexively are going to say they're against it without thinking through it quit- critically. Um, so I think that's that's pretty careful going forward. That um, you know, I, I I certainly have my own personal ideology. I have lots of uh, friends who are direct primary care physicians, and they're politically all over the map. I mean both ends of the spectrum. Uh, and so I think this could be a solution that, that could be politically feasible. Um, but I think it's a precarious thing in America in any topic because, you know, people have to declare a team and whether it's good or bad on their side. But yeah. 
it's growing pretty quickly too, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So when I started my practice in 2011, um, you know, as, as I would define direct primary care, I mean, I, w- I would say there's less than 100, probably even the dozens of, of physicians in this model who are doing bread and butter, you know, strict direct primary care. Um, and, and now there's there's definitely in, you know, approaching 1,000. Um, the communities surrounding this are, are just exploding. I, I, I can't even keep up with the new practices that are opening. So in some regions of the country, in some cities, it's absolutely exploding. In others, it's, it's a little harder uh, uh, for, for various reasons to get clinics started. Um, so there are definitely some challenges uh, in certain states. Um, uh, certain states have restrictions against dispensing of medicines from a, from a medical practice. And so uh, every, every you know, community, every state is a little bit unique. But it's, it's all around the country, east to west coast, um, large towns, small towns. Um, it, it, it's, it's really serving a need in a lot of areas. And, and, and that's the beauty of it is it's flexible. You know, I, 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 I don't have to think about like whatever Washington DC or Topeka, Kansas thinks about how I should serve my patients best. I can look at my patient population, you know, my philosophy and my community and, and tailor my, my business to serve those needs. I, I'm not, you know, looking to them to, to fix the problem. And if it gets too big though, uh, I don't know what too big is, is in this thing, but it, it seems that with the, increasing sort of Obamacare dysfunction, the doctors being driven out of the profession due to various things, but a lot of it having to do with the administrative bloat and what happens because of that. So we have a lot of doctors who might go into direct primary care. If it gets too big, does it does it actually start to challenge the viability of, of insurance models or Medicare, Medicaid in a way that maybe the insurers would try to fight against it? Well, uh, we haven't seen that uh, very much. Um, in Virginia, that that was part of the equation. Apparently, the insurance lobby there was was against this bill, and it was it's kind of a, a minor uh, technicality uh, issue, honestly, in, in Virginia. But um, so there are some insurance companies who who have kind of spoken negatively about this model. But at the same time, there's some direct primary care companies. There's one uh, based out of, of Boston um, called Iora Health, um, who's actually partnered with insurance companies. There's uh, um, uh, several different um, you know larger direct primary care groups. Groups who've who've grown large enough where they've started approaching third parties like that, um, managed uh, care companies, um, even even like a, a Medicare Advantage plans, and tried to figure out how they could work their model and stay true to that model, yet work with these kind of third party uh, uh, payers, insurance companies, and governments. Uh, in, in fact, um, in, in the state of Washington, uh, um, Q Alliance um, actually partnered with a, a Medicaid managed care company. I am a, from my perspective, my personal, you know, business perspective, I'm a little bit skeptical of doing that at this stage just because I think there'll be too many strings attached. But there are certainly ways that people are trying to figure out how this all fits together. And I think we need to do that at some level. We need to figure out how direct primary care kind of fits into this giant messy puzzle. But at the same time, I think that part of the problem has been in American medicine and, and the reason that primary care has, has kind of fallen out of grace and the reason that it's not as good as it should is because we're as, – as physicians, I, I should focus on what I do and do it the best that I can. Um, and so I, I, I have under, I, I'm, I'm not um, stupid enough to think that I can figure out how to best organize brain surgery and payment of brain surgery. Um, that, that I think family physicians, um, you know, we need to be aware of these larger issues and how, how it will work in the system – but at the same time, that's it's so much larger and, and complicated that if I think if we as as primary care physicians focused on our own patients and our own practices um, first, and then have everyone else kind of adapt to us, I think that's a much better way to think about it. But again, we're tiny, and the rest of the system is huge. So um, yeah, I think that's going forward. That's what everyone's questioning is: okay, you guys have demonstrated you can do this cool thing, you can make it affordable. You know, how do we pay for it? How do we make sure that everyone has access to that care? You know, how does that work with insurance? Um, and I, I certainly have my ideas. I think I think insurance could be used in a much smarter way. Um, I think it would be less expensive. And I think the total amount that we spend would be less. And if you look in American healthcare, I mean, we spend, I, I think, over $10,000 per person. If you add up all of the money spent on healthcare in America from employers, governments, and out of own people's pockets, it's, I think it's over $10,000 per person last year and, and total healthcare expenditures. So the, the problem is not that there's not enough money to go around. There's, I mean, I charge $50 a month. That's $600 a year. Um, clearly, there's enough money 
um, per person to go around. The, the, the problem is, isn't allocating that money and who controls that money uh, because the pot's definitely large enough. We just spend it in really stupid ways. Well, you, you mentioned due to the agility of some of these local – it seems like the, the direct primary care model has a lot of versatility to it as you said based on being able to react to your community. In, in one of your blog posts about this, you wrote that the adaptability of direct practice doctors and clinics based on community needs, something is, that's missing in the micromanaged status quo. Some of the DPC practices were helping large employers or unions in urban areas tackle escalating health costs while others based in rural towns were working with a large number of uninsured patients. The creativity of DPC physicians is truly awesome. That seems to be something that's lacking in the healthcare system in general, but that the DPC model helps helps bring back in the innovation that we need. Yeah, yeah, and you know it's funny because whenever I talk to my, my 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 colleagues who are in normal practices, they 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 mostly just scratch their heads like they uh, it's hard it, from the in, inside. It's kind of hard to describe this. So. Whenever you go to a practice management meeting, which is where all of the you know the, the doctors and the nurses and the, the clinic staff and everyone get together and talk about it, you know about the clinic and the business, and they're you almost mean like everyone who works at, a, at an HMO. You're saying, or well, no, I'm saying in a clinic. Oh, in a clinic, okay. Doctors practice, and so whenever you know we have a practice uh, uh, management meeting or a practice meeting, you know people get around and they talk about all of these kind of you know nuanced things about like scheduling and billing and and maximizing reimbursements and you know making sure that we bill out more nine nine you know level four visits. And, and kind of all of these things that really aren't medical care. They're kind of the administrative thing. Like we never, uh, or at least from my experience, when I was sitting around in practice management meetings, very rarely was the discussion about how do we serve our patients better? How do we make uh, our care better? How do we, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, become more accessible to patients? So those are the things like a normal business. If I was, if I was running, you know, an ice cream shop, um, you know, I wouldn't sit around for hours talking about exactly, uh, uh, um, you know, how to, how to bill out my ice cream cone. I, I would be talking about how do we make our ice cream better? You know, how, how do we make the patient's experience or the customer's experience better? Um, and so those are the things that I focus on. But I think in the normal system, you know, we're not really trying to be creative in meeting those needs. We're just trying to, well, there's a checkbox that, you know, Medicare gave us a checkbox uh, in, in order to get paid by Blue Cross. We have to, you know, check off A through Z. Uh, and that's the only focus is, is making sure that you get that paperwork done and put people through that system. They're not thinking creatively about how do we follow up better with a diabetic? How do we reach out to people and make sure they're they're taking good care of themselves? Um, and so we're, we're really, we don't have to worry about that kind of the billing payment system like they do. And I think it, it really is distracting because I think a lot of doctors, they're, they're, you know, they want better care for their patients. They, they would like to have the freedom to do that, but they're basically just holding their breath waiting for Washington, D.C. or whatever state capital you're in to kind of fix these things. And I, I, you know, I, I'm not holding my breath for that to happen. Well, on that then, what are some of the ways that federal or state or local governments going forward might better enable direct primary care or make it more accessible to more people or just otherwise improve it? Yeah. I mean, so there are some technical things that could be done. Um, in fact, there's something called the Primary Care Enhancement Act that has been introduced in Congress, which I presume will take about 25 years to pass. <laughs> um, if, 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 if you're if, lucky. If I'm lucky, yeah, <laughs> with with the right partners. Um, so the Direct Primary Care Enhancement Act clarifies a few different things. It does clarify the HSA issue, which is kind of a big bugaboo uh, uh, in, in this world. It's, it's hard to describe to patients all the intricacies of that. So it would clarify that issue that HSA funds – uh, can be paid for direct primary care uh, membership fees, and that is an eligible medical expense according to the IRS. So that would be, you know, one kind of easy technical thing that I ha- w- would help. But I think on a larger scale, what I would like to see personally, and I, I don't speak for all direct primary care physicians, is is returning some of that money. In, in some form back to the individuals and families to control themselves. Uh, you, you can't do that with 100% of the money. I'm not suggesting we just take that $10,000 and give people a $10,000 check. But if you could give some of that money back to the individuals, uh, and, and that could be funded in different ways. You know, That may be some of your own money, just keeping it yourself. That may be employers. That may be governments um, You know, subsidizing people who need help. Um, if you could return some of that money back to the individuals and let them control it with them and their doctors, you wouldn't need to do more than 10 or 20%. So uh, that would be more than enough money for individuals to control and pay for something like what I do. Um, and I would love to see that happen. I think it would at least kind of create a more kind of cash economy, um, even if it was subsidized for people who needed help, um, that it would allow it would allow physicians to meet those those people's needs and, and, and without worrying about the, the all the other messy stuff. Um, but yeah, politically, I think that would be very, very hard to do because um, it's a big pot of money and everyone wants to you know wrap their arms around it. Now, even within this world of 
crazy regulations and overarching federal programs like Medicare and Medicaid and the inauguration of Obamacare, which is not making anything better. Even within this, you guys have managed to carve out this little space where – would it, would it be accurate to say that this is – a really good example of how a free market or a freer market in medicine can work and what it can do. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, and and, and I, uh, I I don't often um, you know describe what I do as some type of free market solution. But if you really if you really look at what we do, I mean, it's it's me and my patients, and there's no other you know third party influences. So I think when you really boil it all down, that's exactly what we're doing. And it um, sounds like we need to re- then we might need to rethink. Healthcare in this country, yeah. if we're going to fix it, we, we just might be thinking about it in the wrong way. Then, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I, I think that uh, you know, it's funny whenever I hear you know uh, politicians, uh, uh, conservative or, or libertarian politicians, you know, say that they want uh, and, and they they espouse that they want a free market solution. They really don't spell out what that would look like, and I think that's that's a huge challenge to do that. But I, I don't think you can just tell Americans, well, we're just going to, the free market's going to fix it. I think we need to point to tangible things and, and stuff that we're doing. And direct primary care is probably the biggest part of that, that things could be different. We could have things uh, uh, organized differently. Um, and and that, that, that the notion of a free market wouldn't be as scary because, you know, it, it, if I'm putting myself in patient's shoes, when, when I hear, you know, free market, you know, or ca- you're going to be paying cash, what they see is using cash in the normal system, right? So they see that the hospital billed them $8,000 for the MRI and that their insurance company, you know, give them a discount for $2,000. And so people kind of presume that everything else would be the same. They're just going to be on the hook for it out of their own pocket. Um, and I think you have to think much more radically than that. I think it changes the entire equation. Um, for, for me to suggest someone pays for their own diabetes labs, people are like, oh my God, that's so expensive. I'm like, actually, I include those labs in my prices for $50 a month. They're, you know, six to $8 a few times a year. Um, but if I told someone, you know, oh, the free market's going to fix that, what they envision is paying these absurdly inflated prices, which were not created by the free market, um, and, and that basically they would just be on the hook for it. So, um, yeah, I, I think, I think it's, it's absolutely true when you, when, you, when you boil it down to its essence. But I think you have to give people concrete examples of what that would look like or otherwise people just believe that they're being fed to the wolves. Now, a few weeks ago, you emailed me about how Gary Johnson, the libertarian – party candidate who is doing pretty well in the polls about how he is not doing a very good job of communicating on health care and what can be done in health care. And maybe he could listen to this episode at some point and get through all the way to the end where we ask this question. We say if you, if you had them. one thing to say – he should listen to all of them, of course. But if you had one thing to say to Gary Johnson and how he should be talking about health care, what would you say to him? I, I think you have to bring it down to the personal level and 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 being able to to um, tell a story about what healthcare would look like for a person in, in a free market system, I, I think is something that will be required. Um, you know, regardless of people's politics, um, you know, just telling them that this, you know, uh, idea of a free market system is going to make things better is, is not enough for most people. Um, they're, they're very afraid of, of healthcare and healthcare is something that is very important to people. So I, I think politicians, regardless of their, you know, ideology, um, if they want to connect with people and convince people that there's a better way, they have to spell that out in, in real life examples of what that would look like for them. Um, and, and sort of just kind of speaking in theory, because most people aren't nerds and they're not listening to this podcast and they're not reading, you know, uh, Frederick Hayek or other economists. Unfortunately, yeah, most people, more people need to listen to the, to this podcast, of course. So, so, so we help break down the statrix, uh, by, pointing out your practice and then people can realize that things could be better. I think so. And you gave a great example about Uber um, and, and your State Church podcast. And, and I was applauding you that entire podcast, of course. But I think the way you describe the Uber uh, thing is is people can't quite fathom what that would look like. You know, what what a, a kind of a, 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 a some people describe as anarchy in, in transportation services, what that would really look like. If, if you describe that to someone who'd never done Uber, they're like, oh, well, that, God, that sounds scary. And man, that'd be really expensive. And people would rip me off. And, you know, people don't like taxi companies usually. But if you describe to them Uber, Uber, um, they would probably reject the idea. But the very first time you ride in an Uber and experience the the service and the quality and all and the cost, you're like, that's amazing. How is that not how is that not mainstream? How is not how has this not been here forever? Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. 
Free Thoughts is produced by Mark McDaniel and Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.